The modern state of Russia can be defined by two words, Putin and propaganda. Vladimir Putin can be considered the de facto ruler of Russia, a government by and for gutless oligarchs and run at the expense of the Russian citizenry. He's the head and face of Russia, beloved and supported by the people, but due solely to the massive propaganda machines surrounding him. Vladimir Putin, the modern Russian state, and the cronies comprising it owe their existence to their propagandistic vice grip on media and messaging. State-run newscasters like Channel One and Russia One are the primary source of news and information for the vast majority of Russians, and their support for the current regime is unshakable. This is coupled with a myriad source of blogs and platforms, all parroting the same half-truths about Putin's Russia, creating a nigh-inescapable field of propaganda. The content of this propaganda is as varied as it is fallacious, and increasingly promotes the isolation of Russia from the global stage. Russia has of course earned this global ire due to their baseless invasion of Ukraine, but they've domestically integrated this isolatory rhetoric as well. This sort of propaganda often manifests in the glorification of Russia and Russians, telling the people that they are strong and proud, and that the feeble West is simply jealous and spiteful of them. This propaganda is not limited to present affirmations of Russian greatness, but in the lionization of their past as well. There are legitimate areas of history that can be drawn from to this end, such as the Soviet Union's efforts in defeating World War II Germany. At the same time, the state of Russia is all too eager to rewrite its history, such as the recent drive to rehabilitate and praise Joseph Stalin. While this historical revisionism covers all aspects of past Russia, one of the more underappreciated and frankly concerning elements is regarding Russian science. Russia has always been known as a nation of brilliant scientists, from their days as an empire to the USSR. Russian scientists have sent man to the stars, invented effective methods of uranium enrichment and nuclear power, and developed medical techniques that have helped countless lives. With that being said, Russian science was never perfect. It wasn't always the first to develop certain technologies, nor were their theories and methods always superior to the West's. Rather than acknowledge their scientific strengths and weaknesses, however, Russian propagandists have opted to portray their history of science only in the most glowing of terms. While propaganda in post-Soviet Russia has kind of always been a thing, this sort of science history propaganda saw a significant uptick starting in the 2010s. A prime example of this is seen in Zinaida Ermolieva, a Russian microbiologist from the early years of the Soviet Union. Ermolievia is currently portrayed as the Russian developer of the antibiotic penicillin, and even the inventor of the medication. This portrayal is built off a half-truth. Ermolieva was a well-known and respected medical researcher who had investigated early antibiotics. In 1942, she and her team tested a local strain of penicillium, a genus of fungus that was known to produce penicillin, hence the name. The product of this fungus was dubbed crustosin, or Soviet penicillin, and did actually exhibit antibiotic properties. The issue at hand, and where the propaganda comes in, is the fact that her crustosin couldn't really be used as a medication, and that Ermolieva was nowhere near the first to invent penicillin. Regarding crustosin itself, the species of fungus she isolated was Penicillium crustosum, with the crustosin being based on the species name. P. crustosum does produce the actual compound penicillin, along with a slew of neurotoxins that were inseparable at the time. The use of crustosin as medicine could treat certain infections, but left recipients with tremors and a fever. Furthermore, crustosin would quickly lose its antibiotic effects once isolated, making mass production and transport of the drug unfeasible. Quite simply put, crustosin is an interesting product of a unique strain of fungus, but unusable as an actual medication. Regarding the timetable of penicillin's development, Crystosin can't be considered penicillin, but even if it were, it wasn't the first development of it. Alexander Fleming, a Scottish physician and microbiologist, accidentally discovered penicillin in 1928, before 1942. He had left a bacteria sample out during vacation, noticed a colony of penicillium had killed all bacteria in the sample, and published his findings in 1929, before 1942. Cecil George Payne, a former student of Fleming's and fellow physician, would first use penicillin to treat bacterial infections in 1930, before 1942. The closest you have is that Howard Florey and Ernst Chain of the Oxford Group, an international team of scientists working on the mass production of penicillin, had some of their research run concurrently to Ermolieva's. They even exchanged research data regarding penicillin in 1944, and coincidentally, Florey was unimpressed and unconvinced of Ermolieva's penicillin. 
In short, Zinaida Ermelyeva was an impressive microbiologist. She had done legitimate work regarding phage therapy and cholera treatments in the 1930s. She just wasn't Madame Penicillin, as Russian propaganda would have you believe. Over the past few years, Russia has pushed to rehabilitate Ermelyeva's failed Christosan experiments. You've seen postcards and statues praising the woman for her supposed scientific contributions. This framing of Ermelyeva and her medical breakthroughs serves two purposes. Firstly, it erases a Russian failure and replaces it with a success. A simple method of further beating the semi-legitimate drum of Russian greatness. Secondly, and more insidiously, it portrays Russia as unduly self-reliant and innovative. This is not to say no innovation or invention occurs in Russia, but rather it downplays the value and importance of cooperation on a more global scale. The USSR itself moved towards the Western method of penicillin production by the late 1940s, according to credible and even past Russian accounts. There was a manifest benefit towards Russia communicating and cooperating with external nations and researchers. They obtained an incredible antibiotic thanks to Western efforts. However, in erasing the past benefits brought about through scientific collaboration, it makes the pursuit of present and future cooperation seem unimportant or less valuable. It forces on the Russian people the idea that they need not work with the rest of the world, be it in the realm of science, or more gravely, in the realm of geopolitics. Now, the rewriting of Ermelyeva's scientific work wasn't the cause of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. I'm in no way implying that. But it is yet another facet of the inescapable environment of propaganda foisted on the Russian people in directing their beliefs in the desired direction. Zinaida Ermelyeva is not the only figure to be propagandistically rehabilitated by the current Russian regime. You also have one, Trofim Lysenko. Now, whereas Ermelyeva did legitimate research that was stretched a bit for propaganda, Trofim Lysenko's work was total bunk, and only revisited and rehabilitated due to recent discoveries. Under Stalin, Lysenko was the head of the USSR's Institute of Genetics, a government institution with major influence over Soviet biology and agriculture. This position was pretty ironic. Lysenko earned it mostly through political connections, as he had no real scientific background or education otherwise. As head of the Institute of Genetics, Lysenko pushed pseudoscientific drivel and disastrous agricultural policies on the Soviet citizenry, leading to the imprisonment of scientists that spoke out and millions dead from starvation. I have a whole video going more in-depth on this Lysenkoism, check it out if you want, but for our purposes here, one of Lysenko's most prominent beliefs was known as the inheritance of acquired traits. The basic idea is that if you treat your livestock or crops properly, they will naturally grow stronger, but then this strength will transfer to their offspring. The acquired traits will be inherited. That isn't how things work. There's just no evidence that significant traits acquired during life will transfer to one's offspring with classical or Mendelian genetics being the reality. However, starting in the 90s and aughts, you began to see research emerge in the field of epigenetics, the study of how one's genome is modified during one's life. These epigenetic modifications were believed to be inheritable, or in other words, there was the belief that acquired traits could be inherited. This gave some post facto credence to Lysenko's theories, at least on the surface, and in turn, the Russian propaganda mill sprung into action. The framing was that the West got Lysenkoism wrong, despite proving it and discovering epigenetics, that they were deliberately against Russian science and trying to illegitimately discredit it. The issue, however, is that the theory of epigenetics and the theory of Lysenkoism are worlds apart in their implications. Lysenko posited that any and all characteristics cultivating during one's life, strength, intelligence, vitality, would be passed on to their offspring. This is just kind of silly. Epigenetics, on the other hand, merely looks at how the genome is modified during one's life, and has certain implications in aging. In addition, epigenetic modifications are seldom inherited, as the majority are deleted in sex cells, and epigenetic changes are frequently added and removed from one's genome throughout their life. In short, the epigenetic effects on the body and inheritance have nowhere near the influence as those posited by Lysenkoism. The scientific reality of the situation was no deterrent to these propagandists and revisionists, however. You began to see publications rehabilitating Lysenko and his theories starting in the 2010s, such as Two Worlds, Two Ideologies by Peter Kononkov. Published in Moscow in 2014, Kononkov's book is blatantly pro-Stalin and pro-Lysenko, and is more an ideological diatribe than a scientific piece. 
He portrays Lysenko as an earnest humanist that merely wanted to improve the USSR's crop yields, and that his detractors were all close-minded, orthodox thinkers that couldn't handle the Lysenko style. He goes further to claim that actual biologists and geneticists are all pseudoscientists being puppeteered by a globalist cabal hostile to Russia. As an aside, the editor of Two Worlds, Two Ideologies, German Smirnov, is known in part for his anti-Semitic writings, so the globalist label is, unsurprisingly, just a dog whistle. This book was sponsored by Russia's Federal Agency on Press and Mass Communications, by the way, their former official branch for government publishing. This was a supported narrative. Aside from this sort of conspiracy theorizing, there have been less ridiculous efforts to rehabilitate Lysenko such as in Lev Zhitovsky's Unknown Lysenko. Also published in 2014, Unknown Lysenko tries to put Lysenkoism and actual genetics on a level playing field. This is ridiculous, as genetics is an actual science, and Lysenkoism is irreplicable pseudoscience. In other words, it's just a disingenuous effort to legitimize a theory detached from reality only because it was Russian-born. Similar to the Ermolyeva rehabilitation, this propaganda surrounding Lysenkoism serves multiple purposes. The framing of Lysenko as being vindicated after a half-century of Western ridicule presents Russian science as inherently superior and advanced compared to that of the West. Again, while Russian scientists both now and in the past have done amazing work, no nation or group has ever had a monopoly on scientific and technological advancement. In addition, the framing of the West's criticism of Lysenko as arrogant and illegitimate further sows distrust of Western institutions, academic or otherwise. This in turn diminishes the perceived value of more open collaboration with the rest of the world, be that in the sciences or in other international endeavors. The end result is the further promotion of Russian isolationism, this us-versus-them mentality now endemic in Russian society. In summary, as with most other aspects of Russian history and society, propaganda and misinformation surrounding their science is as abundant as it is harmful. Worse still, this sort of propaganda has caused great damage to the Russian people, but also the very subject they've tried to glorify, their science. The overall state of Russian science has a fairly grim prognosis. Firstly, the lies upon which this scientific propaganda is built add needless noise to academia. It's an undue politicization of generally neutral fields like chemistry or medicine. While this propaganda presents Russia as the be-all, end-all of science, it in effect actually hampers Russia's scientific abilities. Not only is this noise a distraction, but you can't innovate in some area if you think there's no need. You can't learn something you think you know. More importantly, this sort of propaganda adds to the greater state narrative, Russia's fallacious justification for invading Ukraine and turning its back on global society. This, unsurprisingly, has had major consequences on Russian academia. Upon Russia's invasion of Ukraine, you had a number of scientists, researchers, and university figures express clear disapproval of this gross action. Said conscientious objectors were often sacked by their institutions, if not actively persecuted by the state descent towards this stupid war was not to be tolerated. For the scientific types, people who are typically well-educated, less authoritarian in persuasion, and with the wealth and means to leave Russia, well, they've done just that. You're beginning to see a significant brain drain of Russia's research talent. They're moving to universities in Japan or Belgium so they can pursue their research in relative peace. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has also led to the active ostracization of Russia in the global community, and correspondingly, many of their scientific collaborations have been axed. Numerous international organizations operating in Russia have either pulled their funding of Russian endeavors or cut their ties with Russian institutions. Though unfortunate for Russian and global science, it's at least understandable. It puts soft pressure on the Putin regime to rethink things, and potentially hampers Russia's wartime R&D. It does, however, greatly limit scientific research both in Russia and abroad, and there are certain fields of inquiry, like with climate change, that can only really be pursued in Russia. Finally, the various sanctions on Russia have affected their import of scientific material as well. The materials and equipment needed to do research, like raw chemicals and various instruments, are no longer being traded into Russia, at least not in any high volume. It goes without saying this makes doing any sort of science a much more costly and difficult procedure. In short, the propagandizing of Russian science in the past has contributed to the tangible harm of Russian science in the present. It's ironic and sad in equal measure, and is genuinely concerning for the future of Russian and global science.
Russia is poised for another generation of humiliation. Vladimir Putin is a semi-functional septuagenarian more obsessed with owning bits of land than supporting his own citizens. He seems willing to move heaven and earth to own Kyiv over an antiquated fantasy of some Russian empire. Many of the bridges his country built over the past three decades have been totally incinerated. Those that remain are rickety at best. Science in Russia will continue to decline as more and more scientists flee the country, their opportunities to work with the rest of the world are robbed, and the country itself grows ever more militarized. It is genuinely tragic. In incessantly promoting lies and falsities, Russia has hamstrung its ability to even seek the truth. More and more propaganda will be spewed to first deny, then explain this decline. The West will undoubtedly be blamed, and Russia will still present itself as the best. But just as it was in the beginning, this slow death of Russian science has only one source. Hey, thanks for reaching the end, and I hope you enjoyed this vid. As someone with a background in the sciences and a fan of history, the sort of historical revisionism and its propagandistic component was something I took great interest in and umbrage with. The consequences are, of course, manifest in Ukraine, but the significant negative effects on Russian slash global science are an underappreciated yet serious effect of Russia's special military operation. The propaganda at hand was something I felt obligated to debunk, and the silent, negative effects on science was something I wanted to shine a spotlight on. With that out of the way, brutally maul the like, hug the subscribe button, and that bell. Until next time, take care.